Greetings, folks, and welcome to another episode of Lessons from the Cockpit. I am your host, Mark Hacera, and for over 24 years, I was a KC-135 pilot in the United States Air Force. Ever since I was a five-year-old kid, my passion has been all things aviation. On the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we debrief some of the most intriguing and fascinating pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. We discuss some of the tactics, techniques, and procedures that these aviators created and cultivated during those extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and even private aviation operations. Our purpose is to show people how does the aviation world work and to expand critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. Many of the stories that you hear on the Lessons from the Cockpit show are being shared for the very first time. And today's episode is being sponsored by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. You can find these prints at wallpilot.com. A lot of people have asked me, Mark, what do you think about the new Top Gun movie? I've been to see it twice, and there's one particular line in the movie that I kind of zeroed in on. The only man to shoot down three MiGs in 40 years. Well, guess what, folks? I happen to know a guy that's done that. And on today's show, we're going to talk to this great American fighter pilot. He's going to tell us about his two big kills during Desert Storm, another one in Allied Force, some bling that he got from one of the MiGs he shot down, and more importantly, share with us some of his lessons from being in industry for over 16 years. Today, folks, we are talking to Colonel Cesar Rico Rodriguez, MiG killer, A-10 pilot, and F-15 pilot extraordinaire. So... Grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. Rico Rodriguez, thank you for being on the Lessons from the Cockpit Show today. Well, this is truly an honor for me, Sluggo. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to be part of uh, an incredible lineage that you have put together of prior podcasts that really do tell the stories of air power, uh, the, the men and women who sweat you know, bullets yeah. uh, being fired at them and firing as well, but firing back and the hard work it took to get them to that point of uh, being able to perform you know, as we would all call it when shit hits the fan. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why don't you tell all of our listeners a little bit of, about yourself? Those that don't know who I'm talking to, Rico Rodriguez, MIG killer and A-10 pilot. Yeah, so uh, let me back up a little bit before the A-10 and just say that uh, I'm an Army brat, traveled around the world with my dad and my mom. Uh, My father is from Puerto Rico, my mother's from Cuba, and we did a lot of uh, great traveling and learned a lot as a dependent. And that really was kind of a motivator for pursuing the career of service. I went to the Citadel and graduated in 81. And from the Citadel, I was selected to go to flight school and ended up going to flight school, the the class of 8301, which was the the October class. Came out of uh, flight school. And as you indicated, after uh, a successful transition through fighter lead-in down at Holloman, uh, went to the A-10, had the privilege of flying the A-10 for just a little over two years, accumulating almost 900 hours in those two years at Suwon, Korea. That's a lot of flying. Yeah. We did not uh, slow down when we were in Korea. We were standing up a brand new squadron. Uh, every day was an opportunity to fly as long as the Army was supporting missions in the, yeah. in the northern sector of P518. Uh, we were going to fly. Yeah. And uh, that was the squadron's mentality and leadership approved it. And so, yeah, we did fly quite a bit and also had the chance to participate in six different Cope Thunders down in the Philippines before mm-hmm. the... Uh, Mount Pinatubo blew that place apart. Remember it well. <laughs> From the A-10, I transitioned to be an instructor at Fighter Lead-In at Holloman Air Force Base, which was uh, where all of us had to go first once we graduated from pilot training and prepare that young young uh, pilot or WIZO to join the fighter force and understand the basics from basic fighter maneuvers, the basic intercept, basic gunnery events, basic low-level events, get them ready to go to their RTU 
and then take on the challenge of learning the the real jet that would go to war. I was lucky enough to uh, find my lovely wife there at uh, Holloman. And so we've been married now 34 years. And we have two great kids. One of your daughters is uh, an AWACS, isn't she? She's a weapons controller. She's an air battle manager. She's an instructor. Yeah. Yeah, she's an instructor in the squadron chief of Stan Val here in Phoenix at at Luke Air Force Base. So we have luckily to have her close by. Oh, excellent. And then our son is uh, is an architect in Barcelona. And so that doesn't doesn't hurt anybody's feelings one bit. <laughs> <laughs> in Barcelona, Spain, really? Yeah, yeah, exactly. How do you get a job like that? Well, he went there and got his master's degree. Coming out of his master's degree, uh, COVID hit. So we thought it was the smartest thing for him to stay there yeah. and hunker down until you know the world got its act together. He did that. And then in the meantime, he proceeded to find some some jobs and has continued to find new jobs. And he's you know, he's doing very, very well. Both of them are. Good. But yeah, we've been blessed with the two kids, 26 years of service with the Air Force, and then transitioned to Raytheon, where I was able to serve for 16 more years as an executive within the Raytheon company. My last gig was uh, basically the Middle East uh, vice president for business development for Raytheon. And then I hung up my hat uh, from Raytheon uh, last uh, this last April. Okay. So uh, starting my third month of retired life. And you're back in Tucson. So. Yeah, Tucson's going to be home for us. Yeah. But we'll uh, we'll navigate uh, not only the U.S. but the world to visit friends yeah. and, and and rekindle old uh, memories and and make new ones. Yeah. My wife and I took our 15-year-old son out of school, hopped on a C-17 and toured Europe for 80 days, 10 countries. Better. It was so much fun. So Very much fun. nice. Yeah. Very nice. Because, as you know, once you get to Europe, the train system is just fabulous. Yep. And there's Airbnbs everywhere. Yep. Hopefully, uh-huh. Europe's opening up, you know. And what was fun was I could sit there and work on my book while I'm on the train. Yeah, that was exactly. That was time, so. You were at Suwon or Osan in the Hog? Suwon. Suwon? Yeah, Su- Suwon had just reopened as a U.S. site. And so we, uh, the Hogs were at Suwon and the F-4s uh, eventually, we have F-4s yeah. uh, and the uh, OA-37s were at Osan for that period. The f 15 sitting alert uh, there at Osan as well. What are some of the stories or lessons you have from flying in an A-10? So, uh, you know, the A-10 was a, an impressive machine uh, for what it was built to do. The, you know, when we were flying it, you know, we, we didn't really recognize it as being a, an electronic dinosaur. Um, but the real truth is, is as all the other weapon systems continue to mature and weapons become more connected to the the GPS grid or to the fighter data link grid, whatever you want to call it, you know, the investments in building the A-10 up to that level kind of fell back. Uh, they were they were not on the above the cut line, they were below the cut line. But during the time when we were flying it, you know, we were able to master the domain 300 feet and below if required. Uh, we were able to master the domain as demonstrated in Desert Storm that even from you know, 10,000 feet, the guys were plunking tanks like no tomorrow with the 30 yeah. millimeter gun. And then those weapons that did become semi-precision became pretty effective in the hands of, of a well-trained hog pilot. You know, the hog continues to to serve an incredible role. Uh, what I would perceive to be the next major event, it'll be a tough, uh, it'll be a tough weapon system to keep uh, in the air yeah. uh, as we go forward. But you know, uh, there's not a company that builds any of the parts anymore. So they're basically scrapping the parts out of the boneyard. And you got to give credit to the maintenance teams that are out there around the world, uh, keeping the hog relevant. And then, of course, uh, you know, you got the weapon school who's taking, and they're squeezing every bit of capability out of the hog uh, and teaching it to the pilots and the maintenance teams that are there so that the hog stays relevant and can it become interoperable the other fourth gen platforms as well as fifth gen platforms everybody says the f-35 is going to be a close air support airplane and i often go yeah i'd like to see that well i think people need to recognize that there there really is a definition change 
Mm-hmm. Close air support is not about hearing the airplane overhead. Um, and that's being driven by those who don't really understand air power. Uh, close air support is about servicing a target that is in close proximity to friendly forces. And you can do that with a lot of different capabilities. You can do it with kinetic and non-kinetic. You know, and it has, if it has to be kinetic, we've got some of the most capable weapon systems out there nowadays. So it's not about the noise over the top of the, the, uh, the friendly forces. It's about what do you really need. Um, and I think we've demonstrated it to a certain degree across a variety of different platforms, everything from a B-52 to an F-22 to an F-15E. Uh, we've demonstrated it in, in a lot of different ways that with the discipline of precision, uh, you can get close air support to those who need it in pretty in, in a pretty timely manner. If you're the guy on the ground screaming for help, and God bless them, uh, we've we've all we all know them, we've all seen them, and we've all saluted them. Um, unfortunately, in some cases, when they've been uh, laid to rest, if you, you know you, you want to hear the the comfort of a 30 millimeter Gatling gun go over the top of your head, aimed at the enemy. But uh, that's not the, uh, the the new definition of close air support. And I think we, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm a uh, anti-hog or anti-army or anything like that. I, I just see this as a reality. We are building building weapon systems today that fly through keyholes when properly uh, planned for and employed. And keyholes is the successful execution of close air support, uh, hitting those keyholes in the time in the time that they need to be hit. It's not going to be one platform does it all. There's going to be a lot of different platforms that have to be able to to service the, the opportunity to kill that enemy. And the hog does it great. It does. No, it you does. I, um, all my army buddies always tell me, why are you guys getting rid of this airplane? Why are you guys getting rid of this airplane? And I agree, there may be some scenarios where it may not be survivable, but they had a hog up at uh, Boise. I think it during the six months it was deployed, it shot 310,000 30 millimeter rounds. Yeah, I had the Boise guys in my squad, in my group when I was at uh, Al Jabber uh, mm-hmm. for Iraqi Freedom. And yeah, the total team performance across five different hog squadrons. Uh, they literally obliterated uh, targets that you know most people wouldn't even try and go get. That was a very different war. There wasn't a contested air war uh, over the top of those guys, mm-hmm. even though they had great cover over the top of them. But uh, you know the days of uncontested warfare are, are behind us. So we got to be, uh, we can't be lulled into that, that complacency that we can go do it with a hog. It has to be an air power. Uh, synchronized series of events with kinetic and non-kinetic. And now we got to think about adding space and cyber into that whole battle space. So, uh, you know, how do you, how do you put these uh, men and women into the the position that they can plan an effective event uh, to be successful? And I think that's where weapon school is really, you know, they are a, a, a breed above a, a class above what anybody else is trying to do. Uh, and they're doing it with both fourth gen and fifth gen capabilities. One of the most amazing things is watching all of that come together at the weapons school during advanced integration is what it's called now. It used to be called mission employment. And yeah. seeing all of those groups come together and work problems was amazing to watch. Yeah. Amazing. You know, they've got a ballistic missile school now. And it has expanded so much. Like you said, the best of the best, our best of the best, you know, go through that school and come out of there much, much better instructors. I thought I knew a lot until we stood up our KC-135 weapon school and then became part of the Air Force weapon school that uh, Mike Drowley is commanding very well down yeah, there yeah, you know, at Nellis. That's right we were given some of the most complex problems as patchwares saying, okay, this is what we got to do. Uh, I can't say enough about my weapon school experience. I tell everybody it was the worst four years of my career standing at the tanker <laughs> school though, because everybody looked at us like, what the heck are you guys going to teach? 
but now we've been going for 21 years and we have, I think, 216 grads now too. So yeah, no, no, uh, incredible. Uh, it was good to see that this, the air force opened the aperture beyond just the fighter side of the house to really make it an air power institution that, that will continue to, uh, evolve and improve and, and make uh, all of the capabilities that we that are invested in uh, make them uh, perform better. I think one of the great things about the weapons school also was the relationships we developed because you know how many times I've walked into a chaos and I've seen guys that I knew from weapons school, you know, Oh, you're here. Oh, you're here. You know, I mean, it was amazing how many of us knew each other during the Iraqi freedom uh, shock and off fight, how many of us knew each other, knew our capabilities and had those relationships already developed because we'd met each other in Las Vegas. Well, you know, the, I, the biggest uh, tribute that I can give to the weapons school is in preparation for Desert Storm, which none of us knew it was coming. They held the standard at the, not only at the schoolhouse, but they held the standard at each squadron in the form of preparing to train, you know, executing the mission, debriefing the mission to the level that it needed to be so that there was no gaps in squadron or weapon system performance. The likes for us of uh, Cluso, JB, Cheese Grater, Rory Drager, you know, Sly McGill. We had an incredible talent group at Eglin that brought us, kept us on, on the sharpest edge possible even though we didn't know what was coming around the corner. And, and so we were able to perform at the, uh, at, at the level that we did. I mean, we had a, you know, not only did we set records from this as a squadron for hitting 16 air to air kills, but really when you talk about our maintenance team, you know, we flew almost 2000 sorties. We averaged an MC rate of 93.9, you know, higher than any other, uh, peacetime squadron, much less a uh, squadron that was deployed. That combination of weapon school, the, the training that we did at home, uh, and then what, what we took with us to, to the battle space, that all came from the weapon school. It, it, didn't, it didn't just happen overnight. There was no fairy godfather who was in charge of all the, the good things that would be reported. It, was, it, it came from those kind of events that took place at Nellis. We, we all owe, uh, as you can you know, attest, we owe an incredible amount of, of respect and gratitude for what was done at the Weapon School and where it's going for the future. You talk about a squadron put together with, I mean, superstars in it, the 58th Guerrillas during Desert Storm. That was an incredible group. No, I why agree. Don't you, why don't you um, talk about that squadron a, a little bit? Because, and you mentioned some of the names already. To have a squadron come together with those people at that time period was amazing. No, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, it was the perfect storm. We, you know, I, I, I give a lot of the credit, not all the credit. I give a lot of the credit to Paco Geisler, who was the squadron commander who formed and pulled together the core of uh, what would eventually uh, go forward. But Paco didn't have the, uh, the privilege to take that squadron to war. It was Tonic Teal. And so what Paco did and what Tonic did uh, was incredible in a lot of ways that people will, you know, may or may not know. But it takes a, an incredible, incredibly strong leader uh, in the form of Tonic to take a squadron uh, recognize the talent that existed in that squadron at the captain level and say, captains, you're in charge. Tell us, you know, tell us what we're going to do. And, and of course, within the captain's uh, group, of course, there were su some incredible superstars uh, that had some specific roles that they had to play and everybody played them to the level that, that had to happen. And they, you know, and the results were there. Uh, we, we tonic had our back and we didn't have to put up with some of the, uh, the Mickey Mouse stuff that others uh, around the calf were having to deal with. He, he knew where we, what we needed to do and where we were going. And so, you know, what Paco did and what Tonic did, uh, both of them could write books uh, on leadership that would read completely different. But when you, when you merge them together, that's where you end up with, you know, 16 air to air kills. That's where you end up with an MC rate, the mission capability rate uh, of almost 94%. You know, the average pilot in our squadron 
over a 52-day war, flew 51 days, 51 sorties. Uh, we had a handful of pilots, excuse me, 41 sorties, 42 days. We had a handful of pilots that flew in excess of 50 sorties. Um, an incredible uh, tribute to, to what they did as leaders to, to make us uh, better as a squadron. And, and that's really where I think, uh, you know, one of my key lessons learned from Desert Storm, you have to build a, a schedule to fly, fight, and win. Um, if you view that schedule as an A team versus B team, then you have already defeated the purpose of, of what the fighter squadron really does when you come together, any squadron any organization when you come together, because if you're going to sustain operations 24 seven for undetermined amount of time, the folks who fly the first mission cannot fly every day, the first mission, and then everybody else sit on the sidelines and watch. Everybody has to be an active participant. And so what we were able to do, the leadership that we had, you know, in my, in my heart, and I firmly do believe it, we didn't have an A team versus B team uh, mentality or approach to flying the, 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 the Gulf War ATO. Uh, we had a squadron mentality that we were never going to turn down a mission. Every sortie would be flown to a, a success level that was commensurate to what the, the air tasking orders required. And then we were, we'd go from there. I've been with other squadrons who uh, tried to do the A team, B team mentality because they were trying to play the game of politics and play the game of, I want to be in a position to to, to get an air-to-air -air kill. And uh, luckily, uh, smarter heads prevailed as the planning was taking place so that we wouldn't end up in that situation. Paco and Tonic, two incredible leaders that had very different leadership styles. They came together directly and indirectly to build what was the premier squadron of Desert Storm. And you guys performed just famously. Well, yeah, uh, but we also had errors. Uh, if you've uh, you've read Clouseau's book, and yeah, uh, Clouseau would be the first guy to tell you that yeah. it wasn't all perfect, and I'd be the first guy to tell you as well that it wasn't all perfect. There were errors made, good decisions made. There were bad decisions made. You know, the good thing was uh, we never lost focus on what the mission was, and we didn't uh, go beat up or eat our young or eat our own team. Uh, we knew that, uh, you know, we landed and we debriefed. We had another mission within six to eight hours that we were going to have to go fly. So it's time to get up, as we would say, uh, put on the big boy pants and, and move forward. And, and that was the key for us is being able to do that. You flew the opening night, didn't you? I was in the air before the first salvo launched. Okay. So I was the last, my flight of four, we were the last four ship. Uh, in the air before the the night one of Desert Storm. So uh, that was where I was at. I flew the next morning. We were doing some decoy operations to see what, what was uh, available, what was going on. But no, uh, I, I, you know, night one was, I was not on night one, but six o'clock the next morning, I was airborne again. <laughs> yeah. You know what, Rico, I'll never forget this radio call. And I talk about it in my book. It was the most uh, I mean, it sent a chill down my spine. I was refueling the weasels and went through the high EWGCI line and everything freaking launched. It seemed like, you know, multiple groups of fulcrums and F1s, Baghdad, bullseye and everything. And I remember hearing Pennzoil check, two, three, four, Zurich check, two, three, four, mobile check, two, three, four. That radio call literally, even now, makes me emotional. And oh, hearing yeah. you guys all check on and move across. You know, it wasn't only later that I realized that Cluzo was the main voice there. Yeah, the super wall of eagles uh, from east to west was the plan. You know, the beauty of that was even though you may or may not be lying abreast, you use the radar picture that is provided to you by AWACS. You do your own radar discipline as a, as a two ship, as a four ship, and the guys were able to execute. And obviously, J.B. Kelp scored the first kill of the war. And that set an incredibly high bar not only for us as a squadron, but really, I think, across the, the AOR, all the F-15s that were there. Absolutely. You fly the next morning. What was that mission like? That is your first combat mission in the Eagle. What were you thinking when you walked out to the jet? Well, I can tell you that fear uh, was, was prevalent. Uncertainty was prevalent. We, you know, we heard 
a quick snapshot of the debrief that took place just a couple hours before where our, you know, we had three air to air kills that first night from our squadron. And so uh, there was a lot of things that went through your, through your mind as you got ready to go out there. But, uh, prior to stepping into the jet and strapping on, uh, I would say I my, you know, I was in a fog. I was, uh, I was like going, Oh my God, am I going to be able to perform my constant, I call it a prayer, but I, I hate to use uh, swear words in the prayer, but I always used to say, please, God, don't let me F this up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Prior to strapping onto the jet, it, there was always uncertainty. And of course, you had a dialogue with the people and the men and women who were supporting you, because I think it's critically, critically important that that what we do and what we did, you made sure that there was nobody on your team that was on the outside looking in from the standpoint of the information. So I always took the time to chat with the crew chiefs and, you know, the weapons loaders and everybody. So they knew what we were going to go do. Uh, And then of course they were the first ones when you came home that would be cheering you and they'd be high-fiving you, but they were right back on the jet and getting it ready to go fly again in, in the matter of hours. Once I strapped on and got the engines, you know, started and disconnected from the crew chief intercom system, then it was habit patterns took over. And that really, again, goes back to how you train as a squadron at home in peacetime. If you train as a squadron in peacetime to, to be the best, then anytime you go to the Super Bowl, you know what the outcome is going to be. If you decide to start changing your tactics and changing your habit patterns, you know, the day of the game, we've seen what all the losers in the Super Bowl look like. Uh, and I think that's what happens in a lot of cases is squadrons make too many changes or make changes when it's really time to be leave everything alone, keep everything calm, do it as you did it before. That's not the time to make changes is not the, in the, in the mission brief for night one operations. Yeah. If you're going to make changes, you know, do them back at home, make sure you test them uh, at, in operations like Nellis and other places like that. Don't do it when you're going to see the enemy in the air. What a great lesson learned life lesson learned too. You know, yeah, in exactly. Our lives when we go, when we're going through, Hard times, even in our own lives, you know, hey, don't change if it's working, you know? Yeah, exactly. What is that they always say? If it's stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. <laughs> We've both been in squadrons and, and situations where, okay, well, now we're here, we're going to do this. Well, why? Yeah. Why would you change what made you successful? Right. So. No, no doubt about that. Uh, so you take off and you go out and you get your first make kill. Talk to us about what happened during your first kill. Well, I can tell you that everything that happened uh, at some point or another, we rep- we had done it already at Nellis, and we had already done it uh, somewhere around the world in a training environment with another squadron, whether it was Cold Lake uh, or Eglin in our own ranges. So the good thing was there was nothing except seeing missiles launch and then obviously seeing uh, fireballs. Uh, there was nothing new, but... It, it was all training. Uh, Mole and I came off of a defensive counter air mission. Uh, we swung to a defensive counter air mission. You know, we had the the privilege of working with a phenomenal air battle manager, Mark Waite, call sign Boner, who was our DCA controller. And when he realized that the OCA controller, who we had switched to halfway through our mission, uh, was a little bit behind the power curve. Boner came up on guard and made the calls that ultimately saved my life and for sure saved Mole's life. You know, those are the kind of things you learn at Nellis. You stay flexible. You know, leaders lead and um, and they don't go chastising people in the middle of a, in a fight. You use debriefs to, to help people get better. And I think that's what ultimately happened on board that AWACS airplane uh, at the end of that mission. We had MIGs in front of us. We had a pop-up mission commander uh, scenario. Um, it was it was like if you were to fly from 10 different locations uh, and you go to Nellis and about 50 miles outside of Nellis, everybody gets on the same freak. You do a quick mission brief. Mission commander lets everybody know what the objectives are, what are the times. Anybody has any questions, you ask your questions then. And then at push time, you better be ready. And that's how it happened. It was pretty, very impressive uh, from that perspective. But then the rest was... We sorted out the MIGs that came out of uh, out of the north. Those two MIGs uh, literally had a mission of dragging us back into the Mez 
uh, the missile, missile engagement zone in Baghdad, when we realized that they were now doping us, it was Boner's call that said, hey, pop-up contacts 030 or two, uh, missed the call, I see, uh, pop-up contacts 330 for eight. Eight and, miles? And that, eight miles <laughs> off of my left wing. Oh, jeez. Uh, now we were... 100% in the defensive mode, reacting to that threat. And it, it was a, it was a spot on call because when I rolled uh, the jet jettison, the tanks and rolled out the, to uh, three, three, zero heading, uh, I picked them up on auto guns at eight miles. And then I started to do the ID matrix, which ultimately prevented me from taking a shot because there was actually rules in the, in the air to air ROE that had some limitations at that point, but yeah. th- that gave mole enough information to continue to, his side of the intercept complete the ID, the electronic ID, and then take a shot. But as he was taking a shot, uh, I was not waiting for, for anything to happen. I was definitely in the de- defensive mode, uh, transitioned my airplane from, uh, you know, 35,000 feet down to almost 500 feet, uh, pumping out all the chaff that I could to decoy myself from the Russians, uh, the Russian radar on the MiG-29. And then use the training that I had been given of, you know, put the threat on the beam, uh, arc the beam, watch for the missile to come off the rail. And before the missile came off the rail, Mole's missile hit him. And that was the first splash of the day for us. You know, there had already been three kills earlier that morning by, uh, by Clouseau and Cherry. And so, you know, that it was an interesting day perspective, but we still had to fight our way out. And that was the second MIG that was following the first guy. And again, it was Boner's call who said, hey, second group North 10. And instead of turning south and running south, I opted to, to, and I directed the formation to go north. And we bracketed that MIG into a high aspect fight, which uh, I would eventually merge with him about 50 feet off of his left wing. And that turned into a two circle classic dogfight, which uh, by the, you know, the end of the second turn, if you will. I was already behind the bandits 3-9 three, three line, and I was in a position to start employing my weapons. When he uh, opted, instead of trying to extend or def, you know deny me a, an opportunity, he, he did a, uh, tried to do a split S maneuver, but you know he, we were bo- both below 500 feet now, so he was never going to make that. He, uh, he, he impacted the ground uh, way before he even got the nose above the horizon. Uh, that was... Uh, Again, a BFM engagement, basic fighter maneuver engagement that we had all trained to do ever since my T-38 days and A-10 days, uh, and then the F-15. So there was a lot of classic uh, exercises that, that transitioned to that day and put me in an offensive position to, if I needed to, employ the weapon. But I, I was credited with that kill when, he, when I drove him into the dirt. You said something, too, about Boner popping up and going, hey, guys, on your nose threat. A guy in an airplane that is, what, a couple hundred miles away from you? A couple, exactly. Has total SA on what's happening in your battle space yeah, and can make that call. And isn't it incredible that we recognize certain voices when we're yeah. flying, you know? You knew right yeah, away it was Boner calling you, didn't yeah. you? Exactly. Exactly. I, we'd been flying together in, in the defensive counter air mission on the west side of Iraq for the past four hours. So I, I knew his voice. I didn't have to do an authentication or anything. I knew exactly who was talking to me. And he was not what I call babbling. He was very direct. Uh, and his calls were, were, you know, we all say if your call builds situational awareness, then that's perfect. If your call trashes your situational awareness, then everybody's got to start from scratch. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that a team of people come together to do something like that and they're not in the same airplane? They're not in the same space. Well, it's the same. I mean, I, I, I give the same credit to the, uh, the tanker crew when I was part of my second kill, you know, we, we were west of Baghdad when, when the AWACS came back and said, hey, we've got uh, engine activity in the H1, H2 area in western Iraq. And Rory Drager directed the flight to go west. And as we went west, uh, we initially thought we were going to be shooting through the clouds and we wouldn't see anything because um, there was a the, the weather was hideous and we were up, you know, 30, 35,000 feet. But we found a sucker hole and jumped through the hole. And as we came through the hole, 
Rory was very clear. He made one call. Everybody just search. Nobody lock anybody up. And so as we search, we built an incredibly powerful, you know, clear radar picture uh, of a three ship Vic formation coming at, uh, out of the, the Western sector. And then when Rory basically said sort, then it was a clear sort based off of our squadron standards. We didn't change the squadron standards. Rory took the leader, Kimo on the north side took the northern one. I took the southern one and Roto, who was my wingman, was searching around us to see what else was there. And uh, then when, you know, we became, you know, when we were in missile employment zone, Wes's, then we started shooting. And again, the heat of the battle, you start to think about really only one thing, you know, get the missile off the rail on the target, don't lose the target. And if you start to see any electronic countermeasures, then take a second shot. And what did I not say we were thinking about? We weren't thinking about gas. And so when we splash these three MiG-23s, uh, Rory directs me to head south because uh, he knows he's low on gas. He knows I'm low on gas. And he says, hey, you know, head south and, and run the intercept to the tanker. I'll be 20 miles behind you. And when I turn to south and start running the intercept, which I expected the tanker to be a couple hundred miles below south of us, you know, I pick up a hit on my radar that's inside of 30 miles. And I lock him up and I, I go, holy smoke, this is the tanker. So I go to his freak, confirm it's the tanker. And he says, yeah. I said, dude, you know, you're over Indian country. Start heading south now. Uh, and, and the reason I needed him to start heading south was, you know, I'm carrying 600 knots and he's doing 310, 320. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm going to go right past you. Like, you know, like if you're standing still, if you don't start your turn. And sure enough, he started his turn. And before he rolled out, I already had my air refueling door open. I was on the boom. And then Roto came in. And sure enough, uh, Hoser and uh, Chemo came in right behind us. And so now we had enough gas to uh, to b either go home or complete the mission. And luckily, yeah. at that point, we were ready to go home. That was a courageous move by the tanker crew who, again, we had never flown with them before. I don't think I'd ever flown with them yeah. before. But I knew his his voice once I checked in with him, uh, and of course I had uh, electronic identification that it was it was a tanker. So at least I knew they were on our side. Yeah. Uh, and then um, and they came north, and they came north because in, inside the airplane, they were like going, okay, these guys are going to be running low on gas. We can't sit down here in the in the southern cap and wait for them. You know, we got to go north and help yeah. them out. And that was an internal decision made by that crew off of what they've been watching us do for the last, you know, four or five hours. So incredibly powerful teamwork that comes back, you know, comes back to the exposures of things like Red Flag and, and uh, other, you know, multi-force and training events that which was really, you know, really uh, you know, what makes us uh, an incredibly powerful Air Force uh, when we train to that level. And I say we makes us and I say the coalition because, you know, we all know that uh, at every red flag there are, you know, there are NATO partners. Uh, there are partners from uh, from different uh, Asian air forces, the Japanese, all these partners that, that fly with us. We all get better when we do it together. Absolutely. And you know what? As tanker guys during that war, I went across one day. I was number three in a four ship. The F-16 that got on our boom, Rico had 800 pounds in his tanks, 800 pounds. Well, that's almost a whole day's full of fuel for an F-16. <laughs> <laughs> he's, all, he's only burning one engine worth of fuel, you know. <laughs> if, it was, if it was 800 pounds and you're, and you're refueling an F-15, then I'd be, I'd be really worried. Which is, uh, yeah. you know, it yeah. was one of those scenarios that we were in during the war too, but yeah. No, I, I'm with you. And, and again, it takes great courage um, because you're, you're defying, you're not defying, you're exercising judgment yeah. and you're using sound information uh, at any point in that, in that journey that you guys made. Uh, I'm sure that if anybody said, Hey, this doesn't smell right. This doesn't look right. Let's get out of here. You would have. I think you guys were using like the crew that took care of us. They were using incredibly high situational awareness. Uh, they were not uh, they were not bagging and dragging, as, as I would say, to to score some points and get more medals. They were doing the right thing, and uh, that that's one of the things that comes out of squadrons that go to places and they train to the right level. Uh, 
the squadrons that chase, you know, sortie numbers or they chase awards for not, you know, for, for not doing, you know, extra, extra hard work in a, in a, in a multi-force event. Those are the squadrons that you can see right off the bat in the planning cell that you go, okay, yeah. we're not going to get much out of them. Uh, yeah. These guys are going to be sitting behind. But you got to treat them like a teammate because you, we can't, we don't have the luxury of, of going solo anymore. There was one question asked by the lead tanker. His name was Dan Favorite. He was from Beal. And he asked this one question. He says, is there any beer around? And everybody knew exactly what he meant, didn't they? Everybody knew exactly what they meant when he said, yeah. is there any beer around us? And sure enough, for wild weasels joined on us. They were all named after beer, as you know. You guys were all yep. named after oil products. We were all yep. named after fish. You yeah. Know, it was it was easy to figure out who was around us. But that was the only question he asked before we turned north and went into uh, airspace. Man, it rained F-16s. They were at 45,000 feet hanging on the blades. Just like you, the mission commander said, turn south now and yep. affected the rendezvous. My co-pilot had his video camera with him and videoed the whole thing. I've got pictures because I had my camera in the cockpit. And again, it was teamwork. Yeah. It was all this teamwork because we realized these guys needed help. And they told us before we took off, you may have to go inside Iraqi airspace to get these guys. And we just said, yeah. okay, fine. Yeah, no fine. doubt. That's what we do. Tell that story one more time about the picture of the missile behind you. Because that is an yeah. that is an iconic kind of thing. Yeah. So you know, on the nineteenth of January, when Mole and I uh, encountered our bigs just southwest of Baghdad, the fight where I was defensive and Mole eventually kills the first MiG twenty nine. This uh, this the the wreckage that was on the ground was. Uh, was being recovered by s several uh, special operations teams that went into the into the country, and and they were kind of all over the place. They found the wreckage as they were scrounging through the wreckage. They find the camera film in a in a metal canister, and of course, they take all this information back to the states. And when they get back to the states, they're processing all the data, that, all the information that they find. Uh, one of the intel analysts is looking at this becomes very clear to them that this is a missile coming straight at the camera, the HUD, the heads up display camera of the particular MiG-29. And so as they start to do the research on, on the events and the location and everything else like that, it turns out that this is the MiG who is locked to me. He locks me up easily uh, eight or nine miles prior to obviously in missile impact. He follows me through a what I call a, a defensive notch from 35,000 feet down to about 500 feet. He's still locked to me in uh, and now on the, in the beam, probably within uh, seven or eight miles of me. I am arcing his position, his radar lock on my RWR, my radar warning receiver, until I see Mole's missile come off the rail. I see his smoke trail in the air, and then his smoke trail literally stops and points me in the direction of where this MiG is. Mm -hmm. And the MiG is now three miles. I can see him very clearly where before I couldn't see him. I, I think I was just too scattered. My visual look, uh, uh, looking lookout was scattered all over the, over all over the sky. I, I, I couldn't find anything, but uh, that smoke trail pointed it, pointed it out to me. Like a big fan. And then sure enough, three miles off my right wing, there's a fireball. This missile, that picture is the last frames of of the AIM-7 coming straight into uh, the cockpit of that MiG-29 driver. So I display that very prominently on my hero wall as, uh, you know, had it not been for Mole doing what he did as accurately as he did it. And of course, the performance of the missile itself had all those things not happened, I probably I wouldn't be here today because that MiG definitely had a very offensive position on me. Uh, and as a result, uh, that was Mole's first kill of Desert Storm. Uh, what means a, a lot great to me. story, you know? Yeah. And Rico, over the weekend, I remembered something. 
you and I first met at the Allied Force Lessons Learned Conference that Jumper, General Jumper had created. We we're all at yep. Nellis. And the intelligence guys, if I remember this right, gave <laughs> you something from an, another airplane. Can Go that's, ahead and tell that story. That's a true statement. As the intelligence and, and the guys who were going through the, the debrief of, of Allied Force, they started to go through a series of uh, geographical locations with uh, grid coordinates. And so I had all that information written on my card for my third kill, which was the first one of Allied Force. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, wow, that's really, really close to where the fireball or the, the missile impact indicated on my, on my radar systems. And so after the guy gave us his debrief, kind of raised my hand and I said, let me ask you a couple of questions just to make sure to see, because I think I have a feeling that this was, this was my kill, the first kill of the war. And so I asked him a couple of questions and he was very, it was very clear. It was exactly that one. He very generously turned around and said, listen, this is, this box of stuff is all yours. And I said, well, no, let, let's play a uh, peacemaker here. You guys recovered a lot of this stuff. I'm sure some of this stuff would also play very well in, in your squadron heritage room because of the things you guys did. So we came to a gentleman's agreement. I got to keep the stick grip of the MiG-29. I got to keep the RWR, the Russian version of the RWR. And then he also, I also got a piece of the, I, I think it's part of the fuselage, but it's a chunk of metal that he gave me. So those three pieces from that MiG-29 are, uh, they're not in my hero room, but they are in my possession. <laughs> See, and that's another great story about from your background and, and the things that you've done, being able to have the stick grip from the airplane you shot down and the raw gear. Yeah. Holy smokes, man. Yeah. I, I don't uh, know of anybody that has that. Yeah. I don't know of anybody either uh, that they could claim, lay claim to the, the kill that they got and then have that, those particular items. I do know. When the when they did that first uh, recovery of the uh, of that of that of that kill, there was a big chunk of fuselage that uh, when the helicopter landed at Chervia, it, it, we weren't really a hundred percent sure it, it was my kill, but we knew it was a MiG twenty nine. And so when that big chunk of metal came to Chervia, the forces the the team that was there gave that chunk. I mean, it was a three or four foot by three or four foot piece of fuselage. They gave it to Raytheon. And so when Raytheon celebrated its 10,000 AMRAM rollout, they had a, a desk memento, mm -hmm. probably the size of an iPhone today, a little bit, you know, kind of like a three yeah. by five card. It had some data there from Allied Force. 10,000 AMRAM rollout, and it just so happened that our squadron was flying that 10,000th missile, a, a square, probably half the size of a postage stamp, was embedded in that plastic of, that, of the fuselage of the MiG-29. And so a lot of people were rewarded with that, both in the Air Force and within Raytheon. I'm lucky to have one of those as well in my uh, hero room. Yeah, uh, pretty, pretty impressive. Talk about BDA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Battle damage assessment check. <laughs> yeah. And, and and they also recovered quite a bit of uh, obviously hardware that was still components of hardware that were still uh, uh, exploitable. So the know, airplane still about, had the radar and missiles and all that kind of stuff on it too, didn't it? If I remember I see yeah. it, I remember seeing a picture of the airplane it's flat, you know, cuz yeah. it looked like it came down flat. But I think yep. there's a picture of that MiG flattened out in a field somewhere if i remember seeing it well i think the one you're talking about is jeff wong's kill is it okay. where he had where he had the double mig kill in the track while scan uh, literally the, the the first missile came in from high above and he was so low that it was just it was a flat structure yeah it just skewered the mig yeah exactly so tell us about the opening night of the Kosovo campaign, when you get your first kill, I mean, that's a big, massive package of airplanes 
going into a fairly small space. You know, leading up to to night one, Dave Goldfein was the mission commander for night one in the south. And we did several uh, several missions uh, prior to night one that General Short wanted to confirm that we, we, the coalition, was ready to go do the business. And I'll be honest with you, it was as close to a, a, a no-go call by General Short as I've ever seen it. As a matter of fact, we had to redo it twice. The first time we went out and we had the, the train, uh, we were the, the pre-strike sweep. Uh, there was, uh, obviously, there was some uh, Aviano uh, F-16s. There was F-16s from all of the coalition uh, in various stages of capability. And then there was F-15Es on the tail end to be kind of a post-strike sweep. The first time we turned off all the lights and everybody went night vision goggle mode, if you will, it lasted about 15 or 20 seconds. As I looked behind us, I saw everybody's lights go off. I could see the U.S. birds because they would have their uh, VG capable lighting. Uh, so I could see them. But it just felt like 15 or 20 seconds later, boom, all of a sudden people started turning their lights back on. It was really just an, an uncomfortable feeling for people to go blacked out uh, without having goggles and things like that. And so we tried it a couple of times and uh, just couldn't couldn't keep the formations alive. Fingers didn't want everybody locking each other up, which is the right thing to do. You should be able to follow each other, you know, in, in a raw radar trail model. So it didn't. And so we came back and landed and the, the initial debrief as we were listening to it from Trivia, we weren't at Aviano. It was kind of like, we need to do this again because that we're not going to get into, into Yugoslavia, you know, with all of our lights on. We'll just get poked. So we tried it again. It was a little bit better, not better, not 100% better, not what I would call, even I wouldn't even call it a red flag ready capability that we could have operated in the red flag environment. But General Short said, okay, they, we had to add some spacing uh, to all the timings. We had to keep uh, reattacks to a minimum. So if you missed it, then you probably didn't have a chance unless you were absolutely sure you knew what you were doing. Uh, on night one. And so we did night one. So we got ready to launch and we were at Cervia, Italy. We uh, we did our intel briefings. We did our weather briefings. I really wasn't paying attention to the weather, to be honest with you. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. So one of the things that came out of this was uh, the nature of, of Allied Force had a lot of uh, what I would call uncertainty uh, involved. Th there wasn't a true coalition in the sense of how we plan and how we distributed information. Uh, there were suspicions in the, I would call it in the locker room model, in the, in the, in the bro locker rooms that said uh, some of our information was getting into the, into the hands of the enemy. And so we were, we were very concerned about that. You really had to scramble to find a common operating picture of the enemy, the, their air order battle, their, SAM order of battle, everything, their e everything. Luckily, one of our uh, Intel guys uh, in the squadron had gone to Intel school with uh, several of the folks who were running the, the 117 cell. And so they had a conversation at the classified level, and it became very clear that the picture that we went into brief with had changed. And so he comes, he comes screaming out of the, out of the Intel shed. Uh, we are already in the arming area. He's flashing his lights. Number one's uh, intercom system was not working, so he sends number. Uh, he sends him over to me, and the the information that we get was that they they can't find two MiG twenty nines uh, up in the Belgrade area. They had they did the nose count, and uh, two of them were missing. We had originally made the assessment that we probably were not going to encounter a MiG twenty nine. So we had kind of devised, we, we were relying on squadron tactics for more of IR threat versus a, a radar threat is from the standpoint of missiles. But it was as simple as saying, okay, break, break. We're going now back to squadron standards, uh, full up Alamo shooters, and everybody acknowledged. So the, change, the changes in the ranges was the biggest thing, but it was a necessary data point for us to be aware of. So uh, now 
your tactics are going to have to change because now you're looking at radar shooters that have a longer footprint. Exactly. So we take off. We, I hear uh, fingers and, and the strike package all checking in and he gives us the, uh, the go as we're all heading south. So we're, we're heading south along the Italian East coast. As I look to my left, which is to the east, everything is dark. There's not a, the only lights that you could see out there uh, were campfires. There was not a single city light or home light uh, in all of that area of Yugoslavia. And obviously it was, it was pretty ugly from that perspective. We get down to the boot. We take the big, huge uh, hook turn and we start to head north. Uh, Cricket Renner and K-Bob are on the west. And then myself and Wild Bill Denham, we are on the east. And we're going to start going north in not a traditional wall because our two wingmen don't have uh, goggles um, or uh, any kind of NVG capability. And so they're basically flying an eagle spread formation, three to five miles, 30 degrees uh, offset. Wild Bill is offset further east. And K-Bob is offset further west. And as we start to head north, uh, the first contact that we pick up is actually uh, one that's over water, kind of a slow 120, 130 knots maximum, kind of heading towards us. And we're like going, okay, what the heck is this? Is this a lost doctor? You know, <laughs> some rich uh, oligarch who decided to go fly on, on, on day one of the war. So crickets tracking that that threat that target as we're watching and then so k bob excuse me uh wild bill and i have the the overland search and i have the low search and he has the high search and i start to get some intermittent hits in between the mountains of, of, of a target that's moving pretty fast and going north so i really bury my radar into the dirt and, and, and kind of thin the radar search pattern so I can get some more hits. And, and eventually I get a lock to a target that's doing about 500 knots um, and headed north away from us. So I call them out to the AWACS controller. There's another issue there between the AWACS controller and us, uh, primarily because, uh, you know, we, we were not flying in what I would call a traditional air campaign, one, eight, one ATO, uh, you know, one comm plan. Uh, we were flying two different ATOs and we were flying kind of a, uh, a bastardized uh, one and a half comm plan. Uh, it was all driven by the lowest common denominator in the coalition. Politics started to play in that decision. Uh, and I give General Short and General Jumper uh, tremendous kudos for listening to my debrief at the end of this mission and then General Jumper taking it on personally and going uh, up to talk to Sakur to say, okay, you, you need to get the politics out of this business. We got to fight a war. And, we, and General Jumper eventually won, which was the right thing to do. As you know, General Clark was never a fan of air power. I'm not sure he knows how to spell it, but uh, it was very clear that in his time uh, during this campaign, he was really more focused on the coalition, not the not the mission that needed to be executed. We started to go through the drill. I started to go through ID matrix. As I was almost done with my ID matrix and, and had a, what I would call uh, eight of the nine steps completed, uh, Cricket was having some radar problems and he was calling out some, some information that kind of got my attention. So I handed off the, the, the MIG in, the, in our group that's heading still kind of north to Wild Bill. And I go over and look at, at Cricket's AOR with my radar. I can see the slow moving target, but I think what's happening in Cricket's because he's directly in front of him is he's getting some gem line uh, interference with his radar. So I call back and I said, hey, that's a really slow target. I'm not sure. You know, there's definitely not a fighter. I feel comfortable enough leaving uh, cricket and wild bill with that guy. And I come back to pay attention uh, to the, to the MIG that's in, in our AOR. By that time, this MIG is now turned. He has started a left hand climbing turn and now he's on a direct heading 
towards the front end of the strike package. So his GCI is giving him a vector to the strike package, which tells me to, uh, we got above their GCI coverage. Uh, you know, we're at 35,000 feet. We're on the blades all day for the most part, just because we don't have a tanker plan for us. The tanker is dedicated to the strikers who are obviously carrying iron and going from there. So we're thinking gas all the way. But as this guy starts to turn towards the strike package, now he's definitely got my attention. And, and I recomplete the ID matrix, confirm it, try to confirm it with my AWACS controller. And the AWACS controller uh, is having a hard time both seeing where I am and seeing the MIG. And again, part of that is due to the uh, confusion of the two ATOs. And so uh, I get to the point where I, I really can't stand it anymore. In my heart, I know exactly what this is. While Bill has also confirmed it's a MiG-29, he makes the radio call, which I call the, the sanity radio call of the day because everybody's voices was getting higher and higher and more exciting and more excited. Uh, and while Bill, the youngest guy in the formation, just cool, calm, calls off a bullseye in the call MiG, and calls confirm MiG-29, which I had already known about. And because of the way our formation was set, unfortunately, while Bill was not going to get to shoot because he would have shot over my tails. And that's that was one of the ROE for us is that we, we were not going to do that. I completed the matrix again at about 37-ish miles. Don't want to give out any classified numbers, but it was a long way out there. I take my shot. Mistake number one was uh, I look over my left shoulder to to see where the missile is going to come from. And sure enough, one of the things that we know about in, in flying the Eagle is, especially at night, uh, when you're calibrating your eyes to, to certain darkness, the minute you put your eyeball onto a fireball like, like the engine, the rocket motor, you, you've just lost all night vision. And that's what, exactly what happened to me. I was blinded for the next you know 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, from the standpoint of being able to look out, I could still see the formation inside the cockpit. And so uh, I can still see that the, the radar is holding lock to the target. I can still see that the target is not generating any kind of electronic warfare against me. Um, I can still see that the threat is not generating a friendly AAI code, friendly mode, mode four or you know whatever. So I'm happy with that. But I can also see that my RWR is starting to light up and I can hear it in my headset uh, because now we've kind of woken up the surface to air threat that uh, existed throughout all of uh, Yugoslavia. A very well orchestrated uh, SAM uh, profile that they, they put together. Very, very good, good work. So I direct uh, Wild Bill to notch to the west uh, to get him out of there. And then I start to check turn to the west so as to still maintain an illumination on my target uh, and, and, and build a little bit of distance between uh, me and the, uh, and the SAMs. At about uh, 15 or 16 seconds to impact, uh, I take a quick look out the window. Uh, I can't see anything from the standpoint of the, of the, of the visual. The, the MIG's not, is not flying with lights on, but I, I opt to continue to illuminate the target at the far edge of my screen. So it's about 40 degrees off my right side. And then as the, as the time of flight uh, clock inside the cockpit is running down from five, four, three, then I pay my attention to, to the azimuth where the MIG is. And now the MIG is gonna be about 15 or 16 miles as the crow flies from my airplane. I'm still at uh, 35,000 feet. He's now around 12,000 feet at zero missile hits the, the MIG. And uh, as we talked about it earlier, it hit the MIG right behind the pilot, right behind the canopy of the MIG-29. Still pretty full of gas because he yeah. generates a huge fireball. But what happens is I mentioned earlier, I didn't pay attention to the, uh, to our weather brief was the fireball reflects off of the snow covering these mountains that we are flying over oh, and the reflection no. comes up people say, well, what did it look like? And I go, you know, I remember as a kid going out to, you know, to the baseball fields 
and turning the power on so we could play baseball at night. You know, if you took 10 or 15 baseball fields and you concentrated them as close as you could and you synchronized, you know, one, two, three power on, that's exactly how the, how, how the illumination hit me, you know, at 35,000 feet, the tail end Charlie F-15E, who is about a hundred miles from where I'm at, uh, as the crow flies, he sees this big glow coming off the mountain. He's like, going, well, what the hell just happened up there? And that was the first, that was the first kill of, of allied force. Interestingly enough, uh, we have a 55 minute vol period that we've got to, we've got to protect because the vol periods was originally only 30 minutes and it went out to 55 because we had to extend you know time on target for all the, all the strikers. So we had a 55 minute vol period and, and this is around the ninth minute of the 55 minutes. So I still got a, a good amount of time to, to hang on the blades and see what else is going on. Now, by this time, Cricket and I have established a counter-rotating cap that gives us a chance to look both east and west. And then every time one of us turns to the north, we would do about a 30-second spin to the north, sanitize anything coming out of out of the, the capital, and then get back into the flow. So uh, pretty interesting night. Uh, and to say the least, many of the effects that I encounter – in my two previous kills in Desert Storm, uh, I encounter them again. You know, a very accelerated heart rate uh, and an adrenaline spike that I've never been able to replicate in anything I've I've ever done except in my three kills. Pretty, and you've uh, got crazy. fifty at nine minutes into fifty five minutes. That's a long freaking time. Fifty five. Yeah. People don't realize when you're flying in something that intense. That is like forever and while bill and i we changed our own fuel jet fuel tank jettison plan primarily because of that and so we emptied out our wing tanks and we jettisoned our wing tanks i did before i took my shot uh, so that i wouldn't have you know potentially introduce any kind of uh interference with the missile shot Mm -hmm. you didn't do any tanking that night Mm -mm. Yeah, we that's really we, unusual. Yep. Really unusual. <laughs> well, as you well know, I mean, we had a shortage of tankers uh for that for that mission. Uh the guys who had pre-strike tanker opportunities were the guys who went north and and they were protecting uh the EA six Bs and the one seventeen. So mm-hmm. the mission to the capital was was the the, the main mission, yeah. the mission to the south was to open up a, a corridor where the, the tanker or the A-10s and the F-16s could start coming in and, and taking out the, the forces that were, uh, you know, basically brutalizing the, the Kosovo Albanians. Rico, we were in the middle of standing up the KC-135 weapons school when we yep. got a, a deployment order for three of us. And I went to the Kayak at Vicenza. I was sitting at the tanker desk, literally less than 30 feet from short. I can remember Clark calling him on the phone and saying things. Okay. And that whole interaction. Years later, when I was teaching at the Joint Forces Staff College, we had one of the generals that came told the guys at CNN, do not put that man on TV. He doesn't know about air campaigns. He's got political motivation, all these kinds of things. What does CNN do? Puts Wes Clark on. On the opening night of like, I think, Enduring Freedom or something like that. Of course, we're all scoffing at him. Why would you put that man on TV? Because he's got political aspirations, motivations tied to a lot of people in Washington, D.C., a lot of my army bros don't have a lot of love for him either. So I'm happy. Well, to you know, that. he, he, uh, he, his, his paper that he wrote at the army, their equivalent of the junior uh, school at Leavenworth, mm-hmm. it was basically that you know, air power was an unnecessary, uh, you know, element that the army could do it all by themselves. And so it was very clear that he, he was very myopic uh, at that stage 
and, early in uh, his career. <laughs> early in his career, yeah. So uh, I would say that if 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 I had had the opportunity to have a chat with him, there would not have been very many sirs. <laughs> and there would have been a lot of you got to be s you know me <laughs> that you y g b s m that's right that you <laughs> think that that you could do this you know in this particular way well and the crazy thing was is he'd call up and he, the worst thing that could happen was him having predator feet at his desk and unfortunately oh. he did and yeah. as you know predator was in its infancy at that time period but you could still see a tang a fighting any kind of fighting vehicle or anything like that and he'd call up on the phone. He goes, hey, there's a bunch of tanks right here. How come you guys aren't bombing them? Well, we got bigger things to do here, boss. Unfortunately, because of that new technology, we saw a lot of things that gave me nightmares for a long time with the VJ oh, yeah. doing their thing. Yeah. No. All right. You know, lining people up, going from village to village. <laughs> but yeah. we did get to even with them one night. They were all, they had all these VJ militia guys had just finished raping, pillaging this village. And there was like an H shaped hotel on the outskirts of the, of the town. General Trexler was on that night. And he goes, you put right on top of those tables. I think it was some of Goldfein's guys uh, the, from the triple nickel who dropped two 500 pound bombs, like right on the dining table as they were eating there. Yeah. So there was some real satisfaction from that, but I've got so many stories from being there at the Kayak watching all of this. And then I got sent to Aviano to work in the wingtip. Dan Leaf. Dan Leaf and, and Ev Everhart. Oh yeah. Ev, oh, yeah. great Americans. Great yeah. Americans. I was within 24 hours of getting an F-16 ride too. When they stop <laughs> dropping bombs, uh, oh. Leaf Fig came up and says, "Hey, Sluggo, I approved you a F sixteen ride." And the next day, they they quit bombing, and they said, <laughs> "Sorry, Sluggo, gotta go home." <laughs> All right, thanks, boss. But uh, I saw both of them years later, and they're just fantastic people. Yeah, you know, fantastic people. So your path and my path cross once again when you're in Kuwait. I'm at Al Jabber. I was, I had just gotten to Mountain Home coming out of the Naval War College. I got to go to, to Tonopah and spend a month and a half there uh, to rehearse uh, three particular missions um, that are still, uh, I would call them, uh, they're, they're not classified, but they're still sensitive information missions. We went there and rehearsed them with all the, the actual players. And then part of that role was that uh, when it was the right time to execute those missions, I would take over as the uh, as the overall mission commander from because we set up a chaos light there at the Jab yeah. at Al Jabber. I remember that. So I got to got to Kuwait in, in late November. We started looking at the big picture plan of what was the what were we going to do, and lo and behold. Uh, we start to do basic ramp space analysis. And we're like, oh, we don't have enough space here to handle what you guys are asking us to do. The next hero, you know, I would call these guys the first heroes uh, Iraqi freedom campaign was uh, the civil engineering teams and the CBs. And, uh, and they came in and literally, you know, almost overnight started increasing our ramp space and not by single digit percentages, but by double digit percentages. But we all knew one thing that uh, when we got to, you know, the Kuwait summer of 120 degrees and high humidity, uh, some of these ramps were not going to be very friendly. And we, we pushed that bubble a little bit uh, a couple of times. But, uh, you know, when it was all said and done, we, we had uh, we had five A-10 squadrons there. We had one F-16 squadron there. We had two Kuwaiti F-18 squadrons there. We had an AV-8 and a, and a Hornet squadron from the Marine Corps there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the crown jewel of, of Val Jabber at the time was the Hot Pits. And the Hot Pits was a, a – it was an ocean of bladders and flow through, I would say, th with the minimum wingtip clearances – that we were able to measure that all that out. 
and and put the bladders in place because we knew we were going to be bringing in uh, many of the E models that would come out of our IUD and they would land there, refuel, hot pit, and take off again. We we were averaging uh, in the first uh, 35 plus days of Iraqi freedom, we were averaging over a thousand runway events a day. Uh, yeah. And, and people don't understand what that's like. Oh, you know, like every 12 seconds you have like a runway event. We were doing the same thing at, at peace. Hat, okay. But Al Jabber basically becomes this massive gas station in the middle of the desert because we don't have yep. enough tankers again. Yeah. We were not only the refueling. I mean, we were also the, you know, for the Navy, if somebody didn't, couldn't take the boat, couldn't could take a couldn't take a landing. We were their uh, immediate alternate. They would land there at Al Jabber, and so we had a, a small Navy detachment that would take care of uh, any of the the Navy birds that would land and, and try and launch them uh, when it was the right time. But in most cases, those those airplanes we would have to de-arm them. So it, it took a lot of our dedicated team. Uh, you know, we didn't get plus ups to to go handle uh, extra de-arm. And, and I'll be, you know, this was uh, what I call the, the success story of all success stories. Uh, Al Jabber was about 70% guardsmen and 30% act. And we really performed like one team. You know, I know there's a lot of people that have mixed opinions about uh, one or the other, but I can tell you that uh, the guard units that were there at Al Jabber were 10,000% professional. 10,000% committed to the mission. Uh, there was no uh, us versus them attitude at all. And it was truly a pleasure to, to have that amount of experience, not only on the flight line, taking care of jets, but also in the air. Because, you know, you, you know that the guard community has a stacked uh, talent pool in most cases. Most of, most of the guys are weapons school graduates, uh, or soon to be uh, weapon school candidates. No, and it was it was truly an honor to to have led them and been a part of that. But they were the ones who made sure that uh, allowing a young you know airman who was just brand new out of tech school, you'd get a, a, a good old crusty uh, guard master sergeant put that young airman under his wing, and that airman became a ten times better crew chief, ten times better weapons loader. I mean, everything. It was just amazing. We experienced the very same thing in the tanker community, Rico, because in the tanker community, a lot of those guys were United Delta American pilots with thousands of hours, thousands yeah. of hours that were flying tankers. At that time period, the active duty couldn't fly the guard airplanes and the guard airplane guys couldn't fly the active duty airplanes. Right. And I sent a letter to AMC headquarters and said, this dog don't hunt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If we're going to increase sorties and if you guys need the gas, if you want crews to fly twice a day, this is what we're going to have to do. And sure enough, they said, yeah, we got it. It worked fabulously. Yeah. And like you said, the guardsmen <laughs> were extremely professional, great guys to work with, just doing fantastic things. And I think that one war really brought together the guard and the active duty and showed the world we can fight as a team and as a very good team, at least from the tanker perspective, when I was watching all of this from the, the tankers. And as you said, and Al Jabra, the same thing. Yeah, so, I would say that, you know, there was times in the early days post Desert Storm where Red Flag was almost only an active uh, active duty event. And then there was the occasional, you had your own guard red flags where the guards would go to their some of their training sites and do their own multi-mission, multi-platform exercises. And then it, it became very clear that that was not only a waste of money, but it was a waste of great talent. Yeah. Uh, I would say four years after Desert Storm, every time that I went to Red Flag, whether I was the uh, Blue Force commander or, uh, you know, flying uh, on, 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 you know, uh, in the squadron level, 
uh, it was it was usually a 50 50 mix and then we also you know the true privilege was to start seeing coalition partners come into red flag um, absolutely and and that made us even better you know that was one of the lessons that we took out of desert shield desert storm that we thought we needed to do more of that you know the powers to be they would dedicate one red flag event to be the the international one and then you'd have a sprinkling of u.s forces there that really wasn't that wasn't what we what we were asking for as captains and, and junior majors you know we were asking for full up you know uh, f-15s from uh, the u.s with f-15s from you know you name it uh, japan you know whoever uh flying together to get it, to do it right and uh and look at the dividends that paid later on, yeah, like in Afghanistan exactly. and Iraq. Yeah. Huge, oh, no doubt. huge. Talk to us about what happened when that sandstorm came through Jabber. Oh, geez. You know, we had some major events that, that hit Jabber. One of them was obviously the uh, uh, a series of uh, scud launches at us where we were pretty much under uh, uh, you know, we were under attack for a couple of hours. It felt like it really was only about 50 minutes. You know, I had never seen a, a Patriot do what it, it could do. And so that was one, but the, the sandstorms that, that hit Jabber. And, uh, in, and in my case, I, I also experienced some of these sandstorms up in, in Iraq as well, but these sandstorms, you know, we call them here in, in Arizona, we call them Habu's. And, and they do the same in the Middle East. They call them Habus. But, you know, this is a sandstorm that, you know, when you look on the horizon, okay, where does the sky stop and where does the sand stop? You, as high as you wanted to look, 50,000 feet, uh, the sandstorm was covering that. And it wasn't a small wall, you know, of about, you know, a mile or two. It was literally 50, 60, 70 miles of these of the sand coming through the the truth was is that you know there were so many uh, missions that had to go fly that we we still launched and you know and you know guys were saying hey i i can barely see the end of the runway and i go hey uh, in, in combat we use you know good good judgment if you don't feel like you can fly then stand it down if you think that you can fly and you've been flying this you know profile long enough you can get above this and go to where you need to be it, we didn't fly at a, at a hundred rate hundred or a thousand events per day we, we tried to keep going uh in support of the major mission i remember when even in, in saudi arabia during desert shield or desert storm we got into one sandstorm where the we were the last four in the air coming home we didn't have enough gas to go back to a tanker. And so the flight lead basically briefed. He says, all right, we're going to take two miles spacing. All right. When I pass the first cable and then uh, I will drop my hook on the left side of the center line, I will take the, le the last cable. Number two, you get on the right side of the center line. You, you drop your hook. You take the right side of the of, of the runway. So the four of us landed in zero zero in the cables, you know, and we waited for almost 35 minutes until somebody could see us on the on the runway. Uh, and then they came out and they, you know, we got the cables out of the way and taxi back. But those storms were just brutal. Uh, although I think the engine guys liked them because they would come back and say, listen, those, you know, when you guys fly through those sandstorms, the engine blades come back cleaner, more pristine than any water wash we could ever do. <laughs> <laughs> the crews are like scooping the sand out and the engine oh, yeah. guys are like going, man, these are the cleanest these things I've ever been. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, there was times when I was in the mask wearing mop gear when the sandstorm hit. And the sand was so fine that it would still get inside your mouth, inside your face. Yeah. And when we came out of the mop gear, it, you know, the, the sweat and the yeah. sand just made a glob of, you know, blob yeah. in your mask. It was, it was a total, you had to wash those things out big time. Oh, I remember that. I, I remember getting up to my desk in the Kayak 
and taking off all my stuff and literally sand is everywhere yeah. and, it, and it's on everybody. And the guys yeah. that I felt bad for the SPs that had to stay oh, the, out in that stuff. Yeah. The security, all the, everybody who was outside. Uh, and again, the security forces guys were the most exposed. Uh, and I agree with you, but everybody, yeah. those sandstorms, uh, I've never, never, I mean, I've seen them again in my uh, many trips to the Middle East uh, after I retired from the Air Force. But, uh, you know, when we see them here in Arizona, uh, you can almost see the back end of them. You know, they're, they're only three or four miles deep, but they definitely cause a lot of havoc uh, wherever they hit. Operations are still continuing at Al Jaber, uh, and you're watching all of this. And I know that there's jets coming back from bombing missions. I think Dan Hampton talked about it in his book. Did he land at Jobber? I can't remember, but I know you're having like emergency airplanes land with emergency fuel and all kinds of crazy situations simply because like you said, you can't see through this stuff. Yeah, no. Well, you know, Casey Campbell, she, uh, she, she flew the A-10 and she recovered an A-10 in manual reversion flying this thing, you know, for a couple hundred miles purely on, you know, muscle power. She, she didn't have any hydraulics or anything. The, the entire base, luckily there was not a sandstorm that day. You know, the entire base was, was uh, on, on pins and needles uh, because manual reversion does not give you, doesn't give you many options. Yeah. Explain you know, to uh, our listeners what that means. I, I know what it means because I've read about Casey's uh, situation, but you being an A-10 guy, explain to people what that means and why it's so critical when you do that. Yeah. So manual reversion is basically uh, all the hydraulic systems that are available to the pilot to fly, to move the ailerons, to move the elevators, uh, to to raise the nose, lower the, everything that you need hydraulics to do is out of there. So now you are, uh, you're fighting, you're fighting the airplane as it flies through the air because that air causes a, you know, a drag coefficient that is also sometimes fighting against you stay keeping the nose up or keeping it level. And, uh, and it's just a total, um, uh, it's it's a it's a physical draining event that is uh, it, that's that's crazy. When I flew the A10, we would we would climb to to uh, fifteen thousand feet, and then we would select manual reversion, which was a a, a uh, inside the cockpit option, so that the pilot could feel what it was like. And you know, for three or four minutes. You thought you were doing, you know, 150 pound dumbbell curls. <laughs> I mean, your arms and your shoulders. I mean, you were using body parts that, with hydraulics, you could control with two or three fingers of pressure. Uh, so w when Casey brought, you know, when we got word that she had gotten shot, and it was more than one bullet, as you guys probably well know, there's, she had a lot of, uh, a lot of bullets. So, uh, that her airplane took, but when she, yeah. when she said, you know, no hydraulics, here we go. You know, there was a time in the A-10 when if you were in manual reversion, the, uh, the first option would have been go to the bailout area. Yeah. And uh, she felt that she had control of the airplane. Her squadron commander was on her wing and he could validate uh, that particular situation. They, they brought it back home and uh, she did a phenomenal job of putting it on the ground and, and you could just tell that she was whipped uh, physically oh, yeah. for for that period of time. I literally, like I said, a couple hundred miles. Uh, she got, I don't know the exact location, but I'm going to say it was pretty damn close to uh, to Baghdad when she got uh, shot at and uh, when she brought that jet back. Pretty close to the same area where, unfortunately, the, the uh, a, a Marine Corps... Maybe was, I think it was a Navy F-18 had gotten shot down and then the pilot did not recover from, did not get out. Uh, yeah. You know, we lost one of ours there, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, very heroic flights. Oh, an amazing uh, feat of, of airmanship. When she airmanship, that thing yeah. Out. Oh, no, a, no an doubt. amazing feat of airmanship. And she wins the DFC, I think, for bringing that thing home, getting that thing back. 
well, well, well earned, uh, well deserved, uh, yeah, <laughs> well deserved, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's amazing is a husband and wife team with four DFCs amongst them. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, incredible. So you leave the military and go and work for Raytheon. What are some of your lessons learned from working in industry with the knowledge that you have of being in the military? I guess the, the first one that I would say is, is that when you transition to industry, it's kind of like my approach was kind of like the same as any squadron that I would go to. I would volunteer to be the best snacko in the world uh, and then work my way up the ladder. And industry gave me that opportunity. They also, once, just because you were in the military and just because, you know, you got three MIG kills and blah, 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 all that, that doesn't mean anything when you're, you're sitting in a room with a bunch of brilliant engineers and program managers. You, you really have to understand what they're doing because you can't just turn around and say, you got to make it better for the pilot because that's just not always going to work. But at the same time, you, you also have to say, okay, you're making it too hard for the pilot uh, or the air crew or whoever's going to employ that weapon. And now you're, you're going in the other direction. Once I established a little bit of credibility with the engineering community, and then they would invite me into a lot of the, the meetings and I'll be honest with you, man, most of the information they were talking about was way above my, my knowledge level. But when you start to connect dots of you know, how a particular line of code is going to do something, then I could start to help them realize where they were, where they could do something better. And that's where I found kind of a sweet spot is to be able to understand, just like in a, in a group or a wing, you know, when you're the wing commander, just because you have wings doesn't mean you only pay attention to what's going on on the flight line and in, a, in, in the airplane. You've got a jack of all trades and a master's of none and go learn what's going on in the services squadron, what's going on in the contracting squadron. All of that, you don't get that if you just sit in the sim building and then in the vault uh, and, then on the, and then in the airplane. You don't get that. You got to go out and, and understand it all. And so I had the privilege of, of being able to lead large organizations in the Air Force. And so now I wasn't leading large organizations in industry, but I was a part of their team. And so when I would start getting invitations to sit in an extra meeting or do, you know, go to another, another forum, that's kind of when I knew, okay, this is what I want to do. And then as I got the opportunity to move up the ladder, uh, I was able to sit in, in more of these meetings. And in many cases, be the, the pseudo resident subject matter expert to kind of say, okay, let's think about this. I, I, I never tried to, to say, Hey, you guys are not smart enough. That was not my style. I was like, let's think about this. Think about how you're going to do it. The other part was whenever I would go to a meeting with our uh, DOD customer, the, one of the things I found very interesting was I, Every time I went to a meeting, I would come back and have a post-meeting debrief. And guys would like go on, Why? what's this debrief thing? Is that a military thing? <laughs> I go, no, no. I just want to, I want to hear what you heard. I want to, I want you to tell me what you heard from the customer. Okay. And I want to hear what Joey and Susie, and I want to hear what they heard. And then I want to convey to you what I heard. Because just like any, any organization, you speak in languages, no matter who's your audience. And so when we would listen to two or three star general explain certain things, it was very clear. I'm sitting there taking some notes and my systems engineer, he's kind of checked out. He's thinking about, you know, how he could do this. And, and this engineer is thinking about that. And so, but when we started to build this common picture from the common words that were spoken by the customer, that's one of the things that I thought I brought a lot to in Raytheon because Raytheon's an engineer's company. Not all engineers speak uh, the language of an acquisition senior officer. They don't speak the language of a crew chief who's trying to put your weapon and run a test bit, you know, at 115 degrees, you know, out in the desert. Mm -hmm. They don't speak that language. And so I was, I thought I, I could help them in that area. And I, I think I did a pretty good job in, in most of those areas. 
I went to Rockwell Collins and mm -hmm. I was a systems engineering manager of 12 systems engineers. I would joke with my boss, Toshi, I've gone as far in engineering as my political science degree will allow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you and I were kind of in similar situations. Yeah. But you, well. but you know what I learned though, Rico? You and I have been looking at MFDs our entire career. Yeah. But we didn't know what was behind exactly. that thing. And now I got to learn what was in that box. Yeah. And how adding different cards to that box not only helped that MFD, but could help the entire airplane. Yeah. Like in the case of the Super Hornet, the Super Hornet needed some extra uh, processing power. And we were able to it put needed some engines vehicles. too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of things we could talk about there. We couldn't in there. Seeing how those cockpit pieces were put together. Yeah. And how all of the things in one little box worked together was an amazing, amazing education for me. And it was always back to the same thing aviate, navigate, communicate. They'd always come up to me and go, hey, like you, will this work? Will this work? And I said, okay, remember these three words, aviate, navigate, communicate. If you can remember those three things, you can put a cockpit together. And some of those engineers couldn't. They couldn't yeah. take a white sheet of paper and put all that together. Some of them could. That was the education for me. And then again, I went from being a systems engineering manager to working in uh, services and mm -hmm. how you, aftermarket services, that was where the real money was. Oh, yeah. I, I found yeah. out the services was where the real money was. And, uh, well, you know, one of the other things about uh, making that transition from the military to industry was when you got in the room with, you know, former uh, DOD, former folks who wore the uniform, you could get very quickly back to uh, how do our two companies, how do our three company, how do our four company, however many people are in the room, how do we give more back to the warfighter? I found that very few uh, folks in Raytheon who had former DOD experience ever had anything what I would call uh, positive or fair to say about uh, either competitors or competitors. But I would go to these meetings and I would get immense amount of pleasure in, in chatting with Lockheed and Boeing and, and Northrop Grumman and everybody else about how do we get capability into the warfighters' hands. And it wasn't like we were ever exchanging trade secrets, but there are so many things that we were doing that were countering each other that we, we could knock those things, lay them flat and then get to the next step and lay them flat. And, you know, sometimes we built, you know, our own hurdles because somebody would say, well, oh, that's, that's, that's Ricky on proprietary proprietary. I go, okay, what part of working together to deliver to the warfighter exactly. is Ricky on proprietary? People, um, as a whole industry, is trying to do the right thing. But the, the real truth is, is uh, it takes a village of listeners and people who are willing to make a decision. So that's another thing that uh, is not very uh, common in, in the industry is making decisions, boom, move it out. Uh, that was uh, th those kind of things. I found great pleasure in my time with Raytheon as I you know got to do 16 years with with a great company and a great bunch of people who respected what I brought to the table because I think I respected what they brought to the table as well. I didn't try and be the uh, quote arrogant uh, uniform guy in the room. It was such an education for me. Yeah. Like I said, to be in a company that truly is a flight deck architecture, brilliant company. Yeah. You know, and learn, uh, and and they do the cockpit for the KC-135. The Pacer Crag cockpit is a Rockwell Collins. Yeah. Now Collins Aerospace. And now Raytheon amazing. Technologies. Yeah, now Raytheon Technologies. <laughs> I know. They've gone from Rockwell Collins to uh, United Technologies, now to you, uh, yeah. to Raytheon, well, too. You know. I, we went to them, I think. <laughs> well, you know, when I saw that happen, I thought, ooh, this is a good marriage. This This will be good, okay? Because I remember a story, 
another major, major DOD corporation. And one of our guys went in and says, you guys make a new cockpit like every two, three years. We make one every eight months. <laughs> okay. The 787 cockpit, when we took it out of our, our series integration lab and the simulator and put it into their uh, airplane, worked the first time. Yeah. And, and it's an amazing thing to be able to have... I know you're a fire guy and a HUD, what we call a HUD cripple to have that piece of glass in front of you that you can see down through the Merc. Right. Right to the runway from seven, eight, nine miles out was incredible. And I got to fly our uh, systems integration simulator into a ball place in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So it's Ooh. high, it's yep. hot, steep, it's cold, steep, snow all those kinds of things, testing one of those systems. And it was amazing, amazing yeah. to see that. The technology that you worked around it was the same thing. You know, you, you shoot the missiles, the Raytheon missiles, they do what they're supposed to do. Now you get to see the guts of it yeah, and why it works that way. That was an amazing thing for me too. Working not only with an engineering team, but then, you know, how do you, keep this thing going for 20 years, 15, six, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Rockwell was really, really good at performance-based logistics. Really good. That was a, that was an amazing thing. Hey brother, we've been talking for over an hour now. <laughs> it's been great to talk to you, brother. Thanks for coming back on with me. No, thank you. So appreciate uh, what you're doing from this perspective of helping those who come on to the many who come on to your your network and your podcast to, to hear the stories. And for me, it's about uh, trying to help the, the next kid who is going to find himself or herself um, in a similar scenario uh, where you're going to uh, go into harm's way and, and, and you've got a mission to do and you let the, the hard training, the, the flight discipline, uh, the teamwork all come together to do what you need to do. Uh, and then you bring everybody home. That's exactly why I started this, was to get people like you and others on to say, hey, here's what I learned. Here's my stories. Hope you guys can benefit from them, which I'm sure they will. Yeah. And that's why I do this. Can you tell I love doing this, that this is a passion for me? Hearing these kinds of stories and lessons learned from somebody like Rico Rodriguez and Taz and Mo Barrett, Blaze Jensen, all these different people that I've had on, Great stories, great lessons learned from their flying careers. This episode is brought to you by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. The two F-15s that Rico was flying when he got his MIG kills are available for the walls of your home and office or hangar in the show notes below. Please share this episode and previous episodes of Lessons from the Cockpit found on my website, marcusera.com, under the podcast pull-down box. On next week's show, we're going to talk to a Navy Hornet pilot who flew the opening night of Enduring Freedom over Afghanistan and the opening night of Shock and Awe. He was a strike lead for Carrier Air Wing 8 on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And I've mentioned to you before that I'm working on a special series for an event that took place 20 years ago. And folks, some of the interviews for this series are incredible. We're going to talk about the Battle of Roberts Ridge with six people that were involved in that 4 March 2002 battle atop of Tackergar. So thanks for coming by and listening to this episode. Please share this with all your friends and family off my website, marcusera.com. And we will talk to you once again on the Lessons from the Cockpit Show next week.